Welcome to the next installment of my home electrification project. We're going to be talking about hot water today. My home currently has a natural gas hot water heater and it's lasted really well. However, as my family has grown, we've been running out of hot water when the dishwasher and so many showers are happening all at once. To start, I installed a 7.5 kilowatt power water heater booster. This was on Amazon for about $350 and the idea here is that as the water temperature coming out of the hot water tank drops, uh, below 120, it starts to add heat to keep the water up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit, up to 7.5 kilowatts. So this solved running out of hot water, but it uses a truckload of power. So with all the electricity I have on tap after my porch expansion, I decided to install a resistance heater, a direct current one, in the drain port of my gas water tank just to dump the excess energy into. I needed lots of stainless fittings and valves, and also a Shark Bite brand water tempering valve, and a Viver stainless head water pump. The issue is that uh, heating water in the tank from the ports is tough because uh, the TNP valves on the top and the drain valves on the bottom, but the bottom of a gas water tank is sloped up like a funnel sitting upside down. So I simply could not put a large heater element in there, even though it would be optimal from a failure point of view. So since I'm not gonna buy a new tank right now, and I ultimately am going to get a air source heat pump to heat the water, um, I just accept that I'll have to remove the water out of the tank, heat it up, pump it, and then put it back in. So I got a stainless steel cross fitting and three quarter inch, put the original drain valve on one side, the pump inlet on the other side, and the straight through port going right into the tank has a three eighths of an inch water objection probe that goes like five inches into the tank and it kind of like points up. So when it's pumping, it sucks the water in on the outside and then it goes back into the tank through the middle. The back up here shows the T-section and the pointing up jet. Now, here's a flow switch, which proves the flow uh, before the water he heat, before the direct current water heater turns on. Uh, then a British pipe thread quarter turn ball valve, then the pump. I struggled to come up with a clean way to plumb it all, but the optimal layout ended up being a triangle. So I used a flexi fitting from Menards, and it was easy to get the angle I needed. Uh, then there's a 12 inch long, three quarter inch diameter pipe section with a DC cartridge heater installed in it. Uh, the over temperature sensor is held to the housing with a hose clamp and a tease used to hold the NTP fitting of that cartridge heater and also provide an exit path for the water. There's another quarter turn ball valve, and then a swedge lock brand fitting that takes the three quarter inch NPT and converts it to three eighths inch compression. And they have the weird like compression fitting. It's one sided instead of double sided like the brass stuff. Uh, yeah, and that passes straight through the cross and back into the tank. So here we see the setup with the uh, insulation around it. The wiring is shown at shows a 12 volt VC wall wart plug and that provides power to a dry contact in the Magnum RTR router. Then there's a cheap temperature controller that limits the maximum water temperature in the tank to 70 C or about 160 Fahrenheit. Then I use the DC solid state relay to switch the battery power to the heater and an AC solid state relay to switch the power to the circulation pump because that's 110 volts AC. This way I can use the state of charge feature of the Magnum BMK battery control thing to control when the DC heater turns on. Now you can't use a relay because 48 volts DC will cause the contacts to arc. And so it has to, ha it has to be a solid state relay. Uh, and then the flow switch interrupts the signal to the SSR 40 DD so that the flow is proven before the heat comes on. Uh, operating, the operating install here has closed cell foam around the pipes, and you can see sort of what the finished product looks like. Now I'm gonna show the different modes that the combined system operates in and the different costs. So starting at the top, if the battery is charged past 75%, it'll activate the pump and the DC heater. If the battery is below 75%, it'll still use the gas burner that's already in the gas hot water tank to heat the water up to 95. Then if the battery is charged all the way up, and the pump turns on and heat kicks on, they'll stay on until the water's 160 degrees, which is very, very hot. Uh, that's scalding hot. Also, if the battery percentage drops below 65%, it'll turn the pump and water heater off. Now, that below that, there's a node that is asking, is the water above 110 degrees Fahrenheit when a faucet is turned on? If it is, the booster will not activate. 
If it's less than 110 degrees, then the booster does activate. If the booster is on full blast and the temperature is lower than 105, people are going to complain. This is the case if two people take a shower at the same time on a cloudy day. Then there's a node where the booster is running and it's able to keep the water hot enough for one shower. However, if the tank is between 110 degrees and 106 degrees, then the booster will not turn on at all. The further the water temperature is above 120 degrees, then cold water will be mixed. So it's delivered to the hot water tank, will, from the hot water tank will be 120. In this scenario, many people can take showers at the same time and we can use the solar water until the next day. It seems to take about six hours of activation to heat up the whole tank to 160 degrees from 95 degrees. So this slide shows like both modes on top there's just a string of sunny days where the solar PV system uh, heated the water perfectly and most of the domestic water did not need the um, booster to kick in to keep it warm. And then in contrast to that, on the bottom, there's two days here uh, with low solar input and it wasn't very sunny and that happens. And the booster runs for all the showers and the dishwasher, which has the distinctive shape of, you know, five, it fills up five times. And the key takeaway here is that the system always, always provides the minimum functionality of hot water in normal situations. And it has the ability to provide heat, free hot water automatically without any user action or input more than half the time in Ohio. So thanks for watching and I hope my work has inspired you to go solar PV for domestic hot water. <laughs>